Okay guys, it's time to get excited. What makes more power? Air to air intercooling or air to water intercooling? Or does it matter? In this video, we compared an air to water intercooler versus an air to air intercooler. Now both cores were supplied by Procharger and they're both sized appropriately for the power output and boost level of our test motor. Now our test motor was a 5.3 liter LM7 with forged internals, but was otherwise basically stock meaning it had a stock intake, stock heads, and stock camshaft. It was fed boost by a BorgWarner S480 turbo. And I purposely kept the boost level low to make the combination repeatable. Now I know you guys want pin the gate kind of boost levels, but basically it's hard to make that combination repeat, even with no changes. Now I know there are guys that will only use air to air, and guys that will only use air to water. But the reality is both systems work to cool the charger. In fact, there are probably applications where you don't use an intercooler at all. Before we get to our results, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of both types of intercooler. Starting with the air to water. Now, for an absolute maximum cooling effort, nothing beats air to water. And the reason for that is because you can run ice water. If you can get the temperature of the transfer media down to 32 degrees, obviously it's gonna cool better than any type of like ambient air used on an air to air. The problem is weight. For a lot of racers, the extra weight offered by an air to water system, especially with a big reservoir and ice and everything associated with that, takes up weight. In drag racing, horsepower versus weight equals acceleration. So you have to make sure if that system that cools better adds enough power to offset the added weight. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. In drag racing, it's a toss up. Places like Bonneville, there, <laughs> there's no choice. I mean, you have to run an air to water with uh, plenty of cooling from the ice water for two reasons. One, you get the extra power. And there, you don't have to worry about weight. In fact, most people add weight to their Bonneville cars <laughs> just to get them to put power down, especially true of rear wheel drive cars where it, the back end wants to pass the front end. So if you need added weight, add that system, you get extra cooling. And also, you don't have to worry about the aerodynamics. See, at Bonneville, aerodynamics are critical. So you don't want a big opening where you're getting airflow through the air-to-air -air intercooler. That's why everybody uses air-to-water. But in drag racing, that's another story. You don't want the extra weight of the air-to-water -air, air stuff, even if it's gonna cool the charger. And especially with different kinds of fuel. If you're already running E85 or even methanol, which is even better, a lot of guys won't run intercooling. Now I have to say, air, uh, intercooling does help even when you're running methanol. But again, the problem is the trade-off. Does it help enough to offset the weight? And that's what a lot of guys deal with. Now on an air-to-air -air setup, it works well for things like road racing or top speed stuff like I used to do out at the Silver State. So if you've got an unlimited supply of airflow, the air-to-air -air intercooler works very well. And lots of guys are using it. They're running around all over. So there are different applications where we run air-to-air -air and air-to-water, but they both work. So make sure the important thing is use intercooling. I don't care which one, just pick one. Let's get to our results. We started out running our 5.3 liter with that single S480 turbo, and obviously we ran it with the two different air coolers. This is the power output of our turbo 5.3 liter run with the stock cam. This is with the air to air intercooler, and our combination produced 559 horsepower and 576 foot pounds of torque. So you can see it's falling off after 6,000, which is kind of what we would expect with the um, stock cam, but this really wasn't about making lots of power, we're just trying to compare the two different air cores. So this is with the air to air. Now let's take a look and see what happened to our power curve when we added the air to water. Look, it's the same. <laughs> the difference we're seeing down low I think is probably just a function of 
uh, how long we hold the load or how much temperature was in the turbo when we first started. See, that's the problem with these turbo things is when you're running them on the engine dyno, you have to be very specific about your test procedure. You have to make sure, and it's hard to do with, without having actual temperature measurements, but you have to make sure that you've put enough heat into the turbo before you start the load. You have to hold the load there during its initial start RPM because you set the RPM uh, range that you're running in the dyno. So you have to hold the load exactly the same, yada, yada, yada. So it's hard to do, which is why it makes it even harder at higher boost levels to get the thing to be repeatable. But, but basically, for all intents and purposes, these curves are exactly the same. Now, that's not surprising given that the water that we were using in the air to water and the air that we we're using on the air to air to cool both of these was almost exactly the same. It was within one or two degrees. The transfer meeting was the same, so we had similar cooling. And both the coolers were sized to easily work with this power output and our fairly low boost level. So these performed <laughs> exactly the same. Despite the fact, as we will see when we take a look, we're also gonna take a look at the differences in charge temperature, because we monitor temperature probes after each one of these cores to monitor the temperature going into the intake manifold after each one of these cores and we and oddly enough we did see a difference in temperature so we'll go over that but right now if we take a look at the power outputs we see that both the air to air and the air to water both cooled the charge temperature both offered the same powering again it's important to note these were run at the same air fuel same timing and same boost level which you would expect given i mean basically if i didn't tell you that these were two different air cores and I just showed you these two curves, you would say those are just back-to-back -back runs on the same thing, and that's exactly what they look like. Even though, we, even though again, the, the, another thing to think about, in, these, in this situation, we had a slight change in the difference in inlet tube length, too. The discharge, you know, coming out of the turbo, going into the core, and then into the motor, because of the way that we had to configure the air-to-air -air and the air-to-water, the length of the tubing was slightly different. But despite that, we saw the same boost, and we saw the same power output. So now let's take a look at the difference in temperature after the core offered by each one of these combinations. Here are the changes in temperature for each one of the different intercoolers. Now we monitored a temperature probe after each of the cores before going into the, the each of the before going into the intake manifold. So we wanted to see what the temperature was after to see how well the intercooler was cooling. On our aired air, this is the aired air curve. We the temperature going into the motor during the during our test run during the dyno pull started out at about 98 degrees and rose to a peak of 122 degrees. So this is the rise in temperature going into the intake manifold with the air to air. Now if we compare that to the temperature change with the air to water, this is what we see started out about the same, right around 98 degrees, but on the air to water, rose to a peak of 108 degrees, obviously lower than the air to air. So you might be asking yourself, why is there a difference? Well, we have the same uh, transfer medium temperature. The water going through the air to water was about 80 degrees, and the temperature of the day during the day was about 80 degrees also in the dyno cell. So that should have worked out fine. What I think we're seeing here is I don't think we have enough airflow going through the core. That's one of the problems with engine dyno testing stuff with an air to air intercooler. Even though the run's fairly short and that dyno cell at Westec has a ton of airflow going through it, um, we even set up the squirrel cage fan with the dedicated shroud for the intercooler and stuff and did everything that we could to make sure that we had a ton of airflow going through it. We just can't simulate what happens in the car. I mean, in the car you don't have any airflow at all when you're at the st staging lane if you're getting ready to drag race or you're at the stoplight or whatever, wherever you're running. As a matter of fact, you might have temperature going from the radiator, radiant temperature going out into the core to heat it up before you get going. But the one thing we can't simulate is when you're when the vehicle's at speed, if you're going 100 miles an hour or something, you're just we can't <laughs> we can't get that kind of airflow in the dyno cell. There's no way to do that, and I think that's what we're seeing here. We saw a similar rise in temperature um, until the very end, until after 5,000 RPM, and then it started going up. And I just think that that's airflow. I don't think we can get enough airflow through that core to continually cool it the way that it would if you were actually accelerating, like on the drag strip. Because you know, if you're, you've got something that's making five or 600 horsepower, you know, you're probably running 120, 130 miles an hour or more. 
and we just can't get that on the, on the engine dyno cell. So maybe it's not a truly fair comparison, but here's the other thing to think about. Even though we saw this difference in temperature, remember, we saw no difference in power. So this universal thing that we're seeing that, that people are trying to promote that this much air temperature is always worth this kind of power, we didn't see that on this test. Now the air fuel was exactly the same, the timing was exactly the same, and the boost was exactly the same, as close to exactly as we can get. But this temperature change, if I told you, hey, we, we did an intercooler test and this intercooler lowered the temperature by 14 degrees that we're seeing here, you would definitely expect a, a change in power, and I would too but we didn't see that in this test. So let me know in the comments, let me know why you think that that is. Is there a difference somewhere else? I mean, we don't have any modifiers in the Holly HP. We don't have, the, we don't have it compensating for different temperatures. It just is what it is. We, we, like I said, the air fuel was exactly on, was within a tenth of an air fuel point, which would be the same as the repeatability factor from one run to the next. Timing didn't change at all. Air fuel was spot on. So let me know what you think. Why was there this change and then no change in power? Let's get, to our, uh, let's get to the conclusion. Okay guys, what's my take on intercooling? I'm pro intercooler. <laughs> I like intercoolers for every application, whether it's a carbureted blow through, whether you're running methanol, whether you're running E85, whether it's a turbo or supercharger, I don't care. And I don't care which one it is. I don't care if you choose air to air or air to water, what you're doing for your application. If anybody ever asks me, I tell them yes, definitely run an intercooler. That being said, I ran my Vortex supercharged 5 liter Mustang back in the day uh, with no intercooler for 85,000 miles. In fact, I ran it out at the Silver State a number of times. And I ran it, I didn't just run it like guys run drag racing stuff, I ran it wide open throttle for 32 minutes. Think about that. How many of you guys have ever run wide open throttle, I'm talking about all the way to the floor, for 32 minutes? When I got back to the guys at Kenny Bell, they, they had hooked up a data logging setup on my Mustang, and I got back and they said, there's something wrong with the data logging. There's something wrong with your motor, or something wrong with the data logging, because it shows 100% TPS for 32 minutes, and then you came off the throttle, and then you went back to wide open throttle. I said, yeah, that's what I did. I said, I ran wide open throttle for 32 minutes. After I went through the gears and got that thing in into fifth gear, I was like flat all the way for all of the race and until we were about 75 or 80 miles in where we got to the narrows and I had to lift off and go down through the gears and go through these turns that are posted at 35 miles an hour. I couldn't go flat through those. And then after I got back through those, it's back to wide open throttle for the, all the rest of the race. And I didn't have an intercooler on that combination, but in my defense, I was only running about seven or eight pounds on this supercharged Mustang. And I had a good cold air source to it. And it was probably about 55 degrees outside when we ran the, when we ran the race. So that's about as good as it can get, short of running E85 or something, and I ran that thing on race gas. But I always try to run an intercooler, and I always recommend them. So whether you choose an air-to-air -air or air-to-water, the best choice is choose an intercooler. Thanks for watching, guys. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. Let me know what you think, and I'll keep making the videos.